I am John Euler, and thank you for uh, listening, and thank you for tuning in to the SurvivorSupport.net's podcast, Survivor Support. Uh, it's my pleasure, it's long overdue, to have on the other end of the, of the line, um, from way down under, I guess that's what we say, <laughs> out here in, in America, uh, Catherine Lyle, who is from Australia. Uh, Catherine, remind me what location in Australia? We're in Melbourne. Melbourne. Yep. And Catherine has done a tremendous amount of work on porn addiction. And so I reached out to her and vice versa. We've kept in touch and it's long overdue. I get her on the, on the uh, podcast. Uh, Catherine has um, authored a book and she's working on a second and it's very pertinent for the work of survivor support because we deal with um, those that have been impacted by sexual predators and we also deal with helping people understand the nature of sexual predation and the uh, connection between uh, sexual predation and porn is undeniable. Uh, for those of us that have worked with men who have harmed people, uh, that's the elephant in the middle of the room. Uh, you're not going to find any sex offense without uh, the person, the man, having been uh, heavily involved in pornography. So Catherine, you have a journey um, professionally, a little bit personally, and that is part of what I want to also uh, discuss because you then, from a female, a female perspective as well as a professional perspective, you can help us see uh, what's happened in terms of the changes in men over the years. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I'm going, I'm going to have you start by introduce your work, introduce your website so people know how sure. to find you. Okay. Um, so it's Catherine Lyle and I work at Integrated Men's Health. That's my own business in Australia and Melbourne. Um, the website is integratedmenshealth.com.au. And I'm a men's health and porn addiction specialist. I've been doing this for 15 years now. I'm a kinesiologist. I am an intuitive healer. I'm a transformational coach. I'm a massage therapist and um, author uh, and psychospiritual therapist. So um, specializing in men uh, for the last seven years of that 15 and um opening up my own business, Integrated Men's Health, where I was uh, specialised and I opened a men's health clinic um, locally here in, in Melbourne. Um, so when I started working with men, I started to see a lot of sexual health issues, um, obviously mental health issues as well. That's where I was focusing. Um, but I started to work with men around sexual health. And I had a man, um, a, a practitioner come in who wanted to join the team. And he was a porn addiction specialist. Uh, I hadn't really touched on it professionally. I hadn't really heard of anyone doing that kind of work um, personally in my life. Um, I had seen it, not not tragically. Like I, everyone thinks I'm a, a bitter and twisted woman that's had <laughs> bad experiences with someone that watched porn. You know, our whole relationship, and um, that that wasn't the case. So I, I've seen snippets of it, and I've and I've been on online dating sites, and you know, for ten years and things like that. So I've seen it in my personal life, but it wasn't until this man came in, this psycho um, psychotherapist, and he wanted to work in the clinic. And because of that, I changed my form. I always add whenever a new practitioner would come in, if it was quit smoking or nutritionist, or I would always change one thing on my form so that I could flag it and then refer. And I did that. And I asked one question, how um, uh, do you watch porn? And uh, do you watch porn regularly? I think it was. And then over time, you know, I developed more around that, you know, how often you're watching it, et cetera. <clears throat> but um, every single guy ticked it, every single one, 100%. And I started to do some research around it and started to understand and speaking to this other practitioner, he never came to work in the clinic in the end. Um, but it was, it was like a gift from God. <laughs> you know, I, I, just, I just went into it and I stumbled across it. And once I started researching it, I just could not believe 
that this wasn't a bigger thing in society, that people didn't know about this. When I started researching the brain and what it did to the body and the erectile dysfunction, and then I started researching um, domestic violence, which I had had experience with, um, uh, sexual assault, which I had experience with, sexual harassment, um, the Me Too movement, and then started researching serial killers, which is kind of where you, you came into my life. Um, not as a serial killer. No, but not <laughs> as a serial killer. But that's how we got connected oh, I because I started to speak about these um, other things where this porn leads to. So my first book was very much around the mechanics of porn addiction and how it affects the brain and the body and, um, you know, the oxytocin and the dopamine. And we'll go into that in a second. Let's give the title of your first book. It's uh, sure. What No One Told You About Pornography. Correct. And it is aimed at... Um, Teen, teenagers, but also parents of teenagers. There's a forward in there. I've had to speak to your kids about this. Um, it's young men. We, we're starting to try to swing the business or swing this whole field and industry towards the kids. And it used to be teens and now it's kids because kids are watching it from the age of five. Um, and, you know, not... Okay, now repeat that, Catherine, because that is so crucial. You know, it's the elephant in the middle of the room. None of us want to yep. believe... Uh, what's mm -hmm. going on, but talk about that again. How young? Yeah, so a lot of the men that I treat who are what you would class as a severe category, so they've got to the point where they can't um, control anything in their lives and they're doing things that, that are um, immoral, like, according to them, right? Um, so men are in you know, public bathrooms um, meeting up with other men and they're not even gay and they're, and they're being humiliated and, and demeaned and that's the only time that they can have an orgasm and you know, suicide and you know, um, doing other things to, to women as well. So I am privy to that information um, and these men are the ones that have been watching it since five years old. Uh, it's very common age, five years old. Now, those kids or well, men were kids were often in um, a family situation that did not support, um, you know, healthy sexual boundaries and healthy, um, you know, just situation and mental health in the, in the family. There was either abuse or drugs or alcohol um, or a stepfather or, you know, um, sexual abuse themselves. So, um, a lot of kids that have been sexually abused are very much introduced to porn at, a, at an early age as well. So there's there's different categories of kids. Um, and and I'm sure adults and, and parents understand that. And when they hear that, they discard their own children because they think that can't possibly be happening um, to their kids. And, and, and it's not true. Um, there are plenty of... Um, research studies out there and they've found between the age of zero and eight 25 percent of kids or a quarter of kids have actually seen porn by the time they're eight years old um and that that study was taken from uh i think it was an australian study or a uk study but there's there's plenty of them around so and 97 percent of kids um, boys have watched it by the time they turn 18 that's no shock to a lot of people um but 50 percent of them are watching it daily and masturbating daily so we have um, a major problem with our kids and our teens, and we have an even bigger problem, I believe, because the parents don't understand this. So how can you possibly teach your children um, healthy boundaries, consent, um, sexual health um, about their own bodies? This isn't just sex education anymore. This isn't how the, bird, the birds and the bees talk. This is... Um, brain damage, mental health, suicide, anxiety, performance anxiety, erection issues, all before they're 17 years old. Um, you know, I've, I've treated 17 year olds and the parents have never had that conversation with them. They don't know what impotence means, um, yet they're having erectile dysfunction. So, so this, this thing around, there's, there's the teens that are watching it, they've got smartphones and they're watching it and, and the average age of kids that contact me now is 13 on Instagram and, and I can't, do anything about those kids because legally I can't treat them. I can send them just some resources and videos, but you know, that's it. Um, but that that's the average age, but we've got a bigger problem. The parents aren't educating the kids because the parents are porn addicts as well. So th this, this has to be, um, you know, the women are porn addicts, the couples are porn addicts. We've, we've got this everywhere um, and everyone thinks it's okay. Or the ones that know that it's not okay don't understand why these things are happening to them. 
And Catherine, that's an excellent point uh, because you have so many adults now that this has become a normal part of their life, or I should say a regular part of their life. And because they have their own issues, they're not um, realizing their kids are now also into porn. And the younger a kid starts, the more the addiction process and hence the impact on the brain. And that's where a lot of your research um, really shines through. Uh, do you want to talk about, uh, why don't you kind of give a, a brief primer or overview of the impact, what's involved and um, the lasting impact then? Yep. So uh, I'll just explain what porn addiction is because there are plenty of people that don't, don't know that. Um, they, they think or they perceive a porn addiction to be someone who is, you know, um, in the basement or in the, you know, the spare room just masturbating all day watching porn. And, and in fact, that's not the case. Um, we've got 97% of men, according to my research, are watching porn regularly. Uh, and watching it regularly is classified as a porn addiction. So anything more than once a month is classified as a porn addiction um, or as classified as watching it regularly. So the textbook definition of um, addiction is if you can't go without something for a month, it doesn't matter what it is, then you then you are addicted to that substance or that, um, you know, it can be Coca-Cola or it can be um, cocaine, it can be um, our phones. Um, if if we, we can't go without it, then there's, there's, there's a hook there and that's normally around dopamine. So a, a porn addiction is created, it's a neural addiction. It's created from um, the, the release of um, chemicals in the brain. So we've got oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. They're the three main ones. I'll go through that in a sec. We have um, tunnel vision, which is created by opiates. Opiates are the feel-good chemicals. Um, the tunnel vision is if you're masturbating and your um, partner is coming home or your mum's walking down the hallway or there's an earthquake, you actually keep going because you're in that, you know, in that zone. Um, and that's why a lot of people who have depression, anxiety, ADHD, autism, masturbate way more than other men because um, their life is... Uh, a certain way and they want to escape from that. So there's a chemical escape happening, not just a mental health or a, a trauma or a trigger escape. There's there's a chemical escape happening there that, that, that people are attracted to. They're more attracted to the chemical escape than they are the actual, once they ejaculate, they, the, the come down is, is disappointing and they actually feel quite empty afterwards. So, so it's actually the chemical rush that they get through the masturbation through the journey of masturbation which they're addicted to they think it's to, to have an orgasm so um, so the oxytocin is released uh, oxytocin is the bonding hormone so it's produced in high levels in um, women that give birth and it's and it's to bond with the baby when people have sex and they're in love and they're all lusted up and they're just thinking about people all the time that's that's all oxytocin so it's it's what the danger in that is that men are bonding to porn and they're bonding that you know no one is ever watching the same dvd or the same vhs movie that they did back in the day um you know it's a different clip it's a different clip every single time it's a different you know they'll fast forward through that clip that they found there's this urgency of finding something that pushes their you know pushes their buttons um and when when they when they do that the oxytocin they're bonding with these acts now there's a part of the brain the subconscious mind that actually believes that everything that they're looking at they're experiencing um, which is massively huge and it's why I'm, I'm doing more work in this area because I'm working with couples now this is why men are withdrawing from sex from their partners from society single men from society from going out to the pub with their mates um, from talking to girls when they do go out to the pub with their mates they're they're withdrawing from society and and it's because of this oxytocin because they're getting loved up that's what oxytocin is from the porn they're bonding with the acts their brain thinks they're actually there so when a woman comes along and says hey let's you know let's date and they're all nervous and there's up to three dates and they're thinking oh should I let him stay the night and all this amazingness is going on with a woman and she's afraid of getting naked and stuff the guy is, is completely withdrawn chemically from what's about to happen and he, he can't be present and he's, 
he's he's done it all. So anyone that presents, any woman that presents um, as slightly vanilla or beige, you know, in the way that she approaches sex, she's not some sex maniac or, um, you know, wants to try all of the fetishes straight up and wants to get all kinky and stuff. Guys actually aren't responding to the average woman when it comes to sex because of oxytocin. Or, or what right, would be you've... normal? What would be normal? normal. Yeah, I, I never use the word normal, but it's it's connected, um, you know, energetic, passionate, um, chemistry, um, you know, the flow of energy through the system. And, and I work very much with that because we work with the Kundalini, we work the sexual channels and the chakras and the energy flow around those meridians. Um, you don't get that when you watch porn. You don't have that happening in your body. So when you connect with another person, whether it's male or female, and, and you are, let's say, dead inside from porn because of the brain addiction, you can't physically... Um, on all of those other levels that people don't generally know about, you can't have that connection with someone. It's, 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 it's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you, you degrade women or that you, you know, men will often say, oh, I don't watch degrading porn. I just, you know, it's not violent. It's just, it's just sex. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't understand what's happening to your brain. The content is actually almost irrelevant when it comes to porn because you're having this chemical reaction in the brain and the body whether it's ethical porn, whether you're watching it with a partner, it doesn't actually matter. You're having the chemical response. And this is the bit that people are missing. So then you've got the, um, sorry, did you want to ask? No, and, and Catherine, let me, uh, let me add an interesting piece for uh, people to really think through. Um, in, in the sex offender treatment groups that I used to do in prison, mm -hmm. um, I had one gentleman who had some pretty horrific offenses. And it's interesting when you do groups in that kind of setting, if you do them properly, you start to become irrelevant during certain points of time in the group, which is a good thing because you want the guys to interact and challenge each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so rare is the time that happens, but when it happens, you can sit back and watch and suddenly the guys will start talking to each other and challenging each other if you have a good group going. And I remember this one individual by the name of Pete. Uh, Pete looked at the other guys and you had a wider range of offenses represented by the 15 guys in that group. And Pete looked at the guys and he said, guys, we all have to be honest with ourselves that we were all chasing after the next point of arousal. Mm -hmm. He used different terms. He said, we were never in the moment. He said, we were always looking for the next hit. And so that uh, confirms exactly what you were saying. And what I try to help uh, people understand, especially men, is it's not those that are um, uniquely deviant, though once they become deviant, that's where they're going to end up heading by degree is prison. Um, but not all these guys started out as freaks of nature. No. These were quote unquote normal guys for lack of a better term that got more and more further and further, deeper and deeper into porn. And it pulled them in directions that they themselves never would have anticipated or never would have guessed or would have said to you or to any of us that that's not me. I I'll never go there. Mm. Yet there they were sitting in prison um, that was not their life's trajectory. Mm -hmm. A number of them had uh, good paying jobs, yet beneath the surface, they had a whole lot of stuff going on. So it really confirms what, you, what you're saying is yeah. they got to a point that what was a baseline for them, it never satisfied and they kept going. They kept going further and further. Yeah, and that's, that's the dopamine. So the dopamine is, is the, the thrill chemical or the, we call it the novelty drug. So I like what I see and I want to see more of that. Um, and we have dopamine addictions with our phones because of those little red numbers and the notifications that pop up and on dating sites, it's messages on, you know, it might be emails for people, right? They're addicted to um, the feeling of um, whatever it is. For some people, it's feeling wanted or loved or um, it's attention or, but we get, it, it's very quick that it happens 
happens. And now it's just a thing where you just go from app to app to app to app to app. And you could be doing it while people are there or you're watching a movie and you have got no idea what's happening in the movie because you're, you're, you know, you're in there with the dopamine and, and your phones. And to go without your phone, and, and this is where people really relate. This is why we have to relate to other things, drug addiction and, and, and phone addiction, because it's boring when you aren't when you're not on your phone so it's very hard for people um, including myself because I do a lot of business on my phone 24 7 it feels like and to just sit still and and really watch a movie without any distractions or to just be or to just sit outside without my phone is actually quite difficult for me um, and I use that as an example because I, I'm perfectly honest you know about that and it's and that's because of these rush of chemicals that you get with porn it's a million times you know times that the phone addiction by a million and that's what happens with porn because not only are you is it sexual content um, it's there's so much of it but you're also um, masturbating at the same time so you're sending off a fireworks display in the brain compared to someone who's just you know kind of addicted to being on their phone all the time and can't actually take a step back but what happens is just like base jumping and jumping out of a plane and people that travel all the time people get this um, come down or this depression after these things occur and they're always looking for the next holiday or the next jumping out of the plane or the next drug hit or, and that's the dopamine. It's, it's because we get bored when it's not happening because you've pumped your system with it. And if you imagine a man watching porn, you know, he might watch it once a week and then he's watching it every couple of days and then he's on three times a day. I've treated someone in America who was watching it three, uh, 36 times a day. So if you can imagine how boring his life is when he's not masturbating and watching porn. He just can't connect with a person, with a situation, with a movie, with a teacher teaching him. He was only 16. So it's, it's, it's incredible what these drugs do to us. And, um, and, and there's also a part of the brain called the hind brain that is the impulse part of the brain. So it, it, this little impulse thing says, oh, we didn't die from this. Yes, you know, we didn't die from this yesterday. We're going to do it again today. And then we're going to do it again and again and again and again. So we often talk in cycles when it comes to porn. You know, how often did you used to watch it? How often do you watch it now? And that's, that's literally the progress through the cycle of the drug addiction in the brain because it was once a week and you just go on with life and it was no big deal and it was maybe if you know your wife wasn't home or you know you were alone or yeah you just had some time without the kids or you know it might have been that and now it's you have to have it and you went from you know being horny to needing porn to make you horny because you've got this kind of drug thing going on in the brain that's that's um what happens in the brain is when you flush it with chemicals like that, um, you and, and not, um, serotonin is the other one. So it's the feel good chemical. You get to feel happy. You get to feel excited. You get to feel horny. You get to feel connected. You get to feel bonding. All of these things and happy are happening with with porn. Um, so when when you do that, the brain isn't built for that to be happening so often. And it's exactly the same as a drug addiction, porn addiction. So if you were to take cocaine every single day, you would be addicted within a week. And that's the same as a, as a porn addiction because um, what happens is the brain tr has, has to, you, you won't die from watching porn, but the brain has to accommodate for all the extra chemicals and hormones in the, in the body um, and being produced in the brain. And when it does that, it ups the level and ups the level and it starts to adapt. And when it does that, it changes all the neural pathways in the brain. So neural pathways are like the little programs, right? So, um, say I, I'm, a, I'm a teenager and when my parents fight, I, I masturbate and I get to feel good. So that's a little program of if, if this is happening, I do this, then this happens. And they, those are the neural pathways. The rewiring of the brain is happening at an age for, for kids where their brains are still developing. And, and when you have that happening, the brain can't cope with all of this, you know, excitement and stuff happening in the brain. So it adapts. And when it adapts, it expects that level, to, at least that level to be occurring again and again and again. And the levels just keep climbing, climbing, climbing. So we call that a hit. When you're masturbating, watching porn, you, you, that's a hit. And then you've got a crash. And then the crash is all of those flooding chemicals have to come, just they just decrease and they go out of the body. And when that happens, prolactin in, in the body is increased. Prolactin causes erectile dysfunction, amongst other things. So you've got 
um, on erectile dysfunction, you've got this constant um, pushing the envelope, fast forwarding, finding the next hit, like you just mentioned, looking for that next stimulation and the arousal to get you off, to get you hard. Because what happens is over time, because of that overstimulation, you've desensitized your penis as well, as well as your brain. So what was turning you on, you know, six months ago is not turning you on today. And therefore, when you meet women, there's no erections, right? And and I've treated men who haven't had erections for 20 years, yet they're still watching porn and masturbating. So still touching themselves, um, you know, two hours a day. So we've got men in their 70s that are coming to see me and I've got kids, you know, so it, it affects all people all the way through and, and women as well. But I do specialize in men. So, you know, people are always arguing with me, oh, you're always focusing on men, you're shaming men. I'm not, I work with men, I treat men, I help men, we, we heal the men. Um, the women, it's exactly the same. It's a brain addiction. Um, it doesn't affect their genitals as much and their erections, obviously. But the other thing that is the problem with this, the come down is around ejaculation as well. So if so, not only do you have a brain addiction, it's causing brain damage. So you've got the frontal lobe, which is being um, damaged, which is your control panel of your brain. And this is where your work comes in. So it's your controlling sexual behaviors. It's controlling behaviors, full stop. It's emotional expression. So for all the guys out there who can't talk about their stuff, guess why? Right. If you have brain damage, um, it's uh, focus and concentration and memory and decision making. It's brain fog. It causes depression and anxiety, performance anxiety. And this is all brain damage. This is physical, biological damage caused by this by this neural addiction. Then you've got the grey matter, which gets decreased by watching porn. Um, just like in a drug addiction, the grey matter is motor skills, um, nervous system, um, so all of it, it's everything in your body. Guys that watch a lot of porn don't know this. And when I meet them, I, I can see it, feel it, know it, both in my personal life. Yes, I'm a specialist, so obviously I'm going to see it. But men have brain fog. They're suicidal. Why do you think they're suicidal? They've got brain damage, right? And when I'm trying to connect the dots here for people and um, they're like, oh, I've just got depression. Well, why do you think you've got depression, right? You've had brain damage since you were in your teenage years from watching porn, right? So it, it's, it's, it's not healthy for anyone to watch any amount of porn because of the neural damage it does in the body. Add in the ejaculation. So every time you ejaculate, you lose vital nutrients and minerals from your body. Um, and zinc is, is the main one. Zinc is what men need to produce testosterone for muscle mass, sperm production, you know, um, hair, skin, baldness, or, you know, acne, all of those things get affected by not having enough testosterone. And there's plenty of guys out there that are, that are taking testosterone in the black market injections and things like that. And this is why, right? So you lose all of these vital nutrients and minerals. You lose half your daily zinc every time you ejaculate. Half your daily zinc intake, right? So men are ejaculating more than once a day. We're not producing zinc in the body. They're not, their diets aren't great. And we don't get enough zinc from our diets anyway. You need to supplement these things these days because of the way the food is grown and the chemicals used and the freezing processes and things like that. So you've got this massive... Um, health problem, which is draining. So all of the nutrients and minerals that you lose from ejaculating are what keep your prostate healthy, right? So there's, there's plenty of things going on. You lose your chi, you lose your life force energy every time you ejaculate. You'll hear lots of men now talking about there's no fap, there's semen retention, um, men, uh, you know, retaining their seed, their life force energy, you know, and, and not ejaculating because you're losing your life force energy. Guys that watch a lot of porn, they're tired, they're, um, they're, They've got no motivation, no desire for life. There's no creativity. All of that comes from the sacral chakra, which is your sexual chakra. So it causes an imbalance in, in parts and systems in your body that most people aren't aware of. Catherine, let's also talk about, mm -hmm. and you did a wonderful job in laying out the, the addictive process, mm -hmm. the effects uh, biochemically. That would be one thing, that would be bad enough if uh, the amount of porn increased and there, therefore 
the cycle that you described. But it's not just the amount. There's something else that takes place and that uh, then sets the stage for us to talk about your upcoming book. Mm -hmm. The quality of what men are using changes. It moves darker and more deviant. Mm -hmm. And that's where you also get into a spiritual dynamic, which I worked with a lot with uh, men in prison. But speak to what you are seeing or address that to whatever extent you feel comfortable in, yeah. in not just the, the quantity of porn that is consumed, but it takes a man from quote unquote normal porn, whatever that is, mm. um, <laughs> to now, let's say the porn of the 70s, to now what is going on, everything from bondage to other things, which then women are suddenly on the receiving end of mm -hmm. as they're trying to date these guys. Yep. So what are you seeing in terms of not just the quantity, but the quality in terms of the, mm -hmm. uh, as it turns more deviant and dark? And I think that's a good point when you say the seventies porn, because um, a lot of women, <clears throat> let's say, uh, so it's a third of women watch porn versus versus men in terms of the the thing. But the women, I don't think, or the parents as well, don't understand what's out there now versus back then. When we were growing up, we might have seen a VHS and, you know, um, I still remember the name of the one that I saw and it was shocking and it was weird. It was, you know, it was whatever and it was all fantasy. But I don't think people realise what's what's out there now and what people are watching because anyone that watches porn has to go through that journey. There is no choice. You have no choice. You, you start off watching porn type A and you end up, watching, you know, right down the alphabet of, of how many time, how many different types of porn, because your brain isn't satisfied with anything that you've seen before, because it's not stimulating you anymore. So you need to find something else. A very, very common issue that I deal with are men that um, are questioning their sexuality and into trans porn and transgender um, people in their lives, like dating and things, and they don't even consider themselves gay or bi. And that's a very common thing that's happening at the moment. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what's going on. They've got all the violent porn, obviously. Um, I don't think, uh, in my book, I talk about porn to predator and um, there is no judgment on, on people. We're talking about what porn does to the person and, and what journey that takes them down. And it takes them down a rabbit hole. You know, guys are saying, I, I, I'm up five hours in the middle of the night watching porn. I'm down the rabbit hole. You know, they get stuck and they can't come out because it's just one thing after another. And they end up watching gay porn and violent porn. And as a woman um, in the dating scene, and this is in my book as well, um, I talk about the erosion of relationships. I talk about dating in a world full of porn, the laws you break, the boundaries you violate, porn to predator. These are all um, chapter titles in my book because my personal experience, which is something I haven't talked about up until now because I wanted, I, I never wanted to be seen as shaming men or hating men or being bitter or anything like that because I work with men on such a beautiful deep level um, and I, I, I love men. However, I have had some horrific experiences in my life. And as a general rule, the dating scene is, is horrific. It's horrible. It's, um, it's not even worth going into, to be honest. Um, when you do the work as a woman or a man um, and you do evolve and work on yourself and you start to see these things, it's very difficult to just jump into a, a, a pool full of people and, and be satisfied with what's coming at you. There's a lot of... Um, you know, Tinder, for example, is yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So that taps into the dopamine of people are just doing that as an exercise. So they might match with people that are really good looking and they, and they get that dopamine rush. They'll talk to you for two seconds and then bang, disappear and off they go again. So I see porn addiction there. So that same addictive cycle of hit, crash, hit, crash is happening on the dating scene in terms of the dating sites. It's happening in the, in the, in the pubs, in the bars, because you see the men all um, congregate with each other they're out with their mates they're having a drink they they they're very insular so they they're, they're all suffering from from performance anxiety basically um and not just performance anxieties in sex but social anxiety 
So then they have a few drinks and then, and then things start to change. You start to get them staring at you and ogling at you. No one talks to us anymore, the women. There's this drunken kind of, oh, okay, now I'm drunk enough and I'm confident enough and um, they'll start to stare and they'll start to say things to their mates. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just slight and subtle, but I see it because of the work that I do. Now, in terms of sex with men these days, a majority of them have erectile dysfunction issues. So either premature ejaculation, um, erection issues, um, or they have trouble reaching orgasm because there's no stimulus happening, even though they're having sex with you and you're naked and vulnerable. Um, so that's, that's almost 100% of cases that I've seen. The only guys that I haven't had that experience with are men that don't watch porn and never have. Um, and that's, that's a whole other, you know, control group that I've been, you know, researching over time. But the, but the average guy these days will try and choke you, um, not choke you to death. So there's, there's a big, there's this big thing out there. The perception of what choking means through sex is someone placing their hand on your throat. Now they might be doing it out of passion. They might be doing it because it's, it's just, you know, there's, it's getting rough and passionate, but it's still a choking thing. And that's happening a lot. The slapping is happening. And a that lot. never, that never was. No, you know, I, you know, never uh, ever in my life before, you know, this became a thing was, were any mm -hmm. men pushing boundaries like that? Um, you know, there's, there's slapping, there's choking, there's spitting, there's hair pulling. It's, it's fairly common in, in most, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of women watch me talk and they either resonate with it or they get really defensive about it because and then, and then I asked them, you know, how long have you been in your relationship for? Oh, 20, 30 years. Okay, well, you, you don't have that access. You haven't seen the progress or the, the lack of progress from, from men de-evolving de over time from pornography. Um, you know, I, can, I haven't been on a date for two years and I've been single the whole time. And it's because... The conversation, it, it's, it's not even during the sex now. It's, it's peeled back to um, the initial conversations that you have that they, they don't show you respect. They ask you, where do you like a guy to come? Do you like anal? You know, where, do you squirt? It's like, sorry, and, and your name is? Like it's, it's become that bad and there's dick pics all the time and everyone knows about my journey with that. Um, you know, it's, you you can't even get to the point of having an in-depth, connected, beautiful conversation with someone where you start to get butterflies and that where you think, oh, I'm going to give him my phone number. It doesn't even happen anymore. Um, and that's all across all dating sites. And I've done research. I haven't just gone in personally. I've gone in, you know, with, with my professional hat on to see what's out there. I've done videos about it. Um, it's in my book. We have to do something about this. We, we just have to. Our daughters, I, this is why my why. I've dedicated my book to my daughter and to all the girls out there, including me being a girl. We're, we're all um, experiencing um, some it's not even the negativity and, and the bad things that are happening because they, they don't always happen. But what's missing is the connection, the guys being present, the guys being connected energetically, the mind blowing, uh, leave your body, have an out of body experience, don't even know what's happening in your energy systems. That doesn't happen anymore. It's not happening. Um, the connection is missing. There's, there's, no connection in relationships. I speak to couples all the time. They come in, they sit there, they talk about their stuff. And I just think, holy moly, I have to give these people an intimacy exercise and they can't even look at each other. They hate each other. Their body language says, I'm, I'm not attracted to you. I'm not interested in touching you. I don't want you to touch me. Those relationships are over, right? And they come and see me and, and I, I try and... Um, uh, you know, swing them towards, um, you know, a, a civil breakup with a respectful civil breakup because people are staying together because of vows and people are treating each other very badly. And I, I'm doing this, I'm writing this book and, and being very vulnerable about my own experiences. There are chapters in there about specific men. Um, it's all anonymous, obviously. Legally, I have to do that. But there's a chapter in there called... Um, every Tom, Dick and Harry, and it, it, and it goes into all of the experiences that I've had where I've been sexually disrespected. 
and writing that chapter was was therapy and it's been really hard to write this book because I said when I set out it was about toxic masculinity and the me too movement and and when I started to get personal about it it was it was quite difficult and I'm I'm on hold with it at the moment it is being launched in March but I'm I'm taking some time out to do some healing myself because in the book it doesn't just talk about all of my Let's stuff. The title of it, it's the uncensored yeah. threat. Is that the uncensored that threat? The yeah, losing generations to pornography. That's what it is, and it's an epic bible. I don't know how my editor is going to cope with it because it's it's nearly a hundred thousand words. Um, there's a lot to say, <laughs> as it turns out. So, um, what I want to do though is bring that book into a place of love and and healing, and and that's where I'm sitting with it now because there is a lot of doom and gloom around this topic. There is a lot of toxic masculinity bad behavior brain damage people that you know I, I even go into serial killers and I give examples of, of the extreme version of, of where this is going um and there's even you know there's some information in there John's written some stuff for me as well so it's it's there's stories in there from men um who are porn addicts there's stories in there from women who have been partners of porn addiction and and most of the time from memory there's been domestic violence, sexual assault, um, all coupled in with, you know, um, crossing boundaries with because of porn. So the book will come to a place of the last chapter is called Come Back to You. And it's about um, how to arouse yourself, how to reconnect to women, how to it's, it's how to heal from this. And, and that's where my coaching and my programs and my treatments all come into that because my, my, my question to myself now is how can I get people to do this without me, right? Because there's only one of me and I need to train people and I like to empower people with how to overcome these things. And there's plenty of guys that contact me that have never done work with me and they've said, I watched this video, I read your book, I did this and I've given up porn, thank you so much. That's it, that's all it took was some education. But with other people, there's some severe damage there, um, whether it's in their relationship or in their, their behaviours, and, and we need to um, undo that brain damage. So how do we actually do that? There's lots of stuff in there about energy and self-pleasure and arousal and energy techniques with the microcosmic orbit. Um, there's a lot of tantric and Taoism practices in there, um, connection exercises for your partner, intimacy exercises. So that's, that's where it's going to um, because I can't release this just with the doom and gloom in there. Not only will I get attacked, um, it doesn't feel finished and, and that's where I'm at at the moment. So um, that will be released in March and in paperback, which is really exciting. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, let me um, help defend your work a little bit. Sure. What I would say to the women listening to us is that if you have um, a man who is treating you disrespectfully, ever lays his hand upon you. Uh, Catherine, we were just talking about the choking thing. Mm. If any man is at a point where he begins choking a woman, ladies, I just want to say you're dealing with a man that is uh, morphing into a psychopath. You cannot uh, disregard that. I want to talk to any guy, any guy that thinks it's reasonable. I don't care if that's because you've watched it or somehow you were uh, telling yourself this is a reasonable thing to do. Never put your hand on a woman's throat, period. It doesn't belong there. Um, and any of the other stuff. And so I would really caution women uh, mm -hmm. against believing that anything they see in Fifty Shades of Grey, any of the bondage stuff, any of the kink stuff, none of that is normal. None of that is healthy. None of that goes anywhere good because they may think, and that's why the, the difference between the term erotica versus porn. Erotica for women will always have a storyline. Mm. It'll revolve around relationships. In one way or another, the themes tend to be, they're gonna rescue this wounded man. Ladies, yeah. I just wanna tell you, uh, there's no man that's wounded that's going to start hurting someone else. That's a misnomer. Because the moment a guy begins to become an oppressor, uh, his days of being a victim are over. Mm -hmm. 
and that's that would be my message when yeah. I worked with guys in prison as well. So uh, just a word to the wise for women, and mm -hmm. therefore to maybe take some heat off of you, Catherine, from the <laughs> negative press that you might receive even from this, mm -hmm. that uh, nothing you said should be controversial whatsoever. No, no. And, no. and that is, um, there's a whole chapter in my book around one person. Uh, he, he was an evolved man, I thought. In the, he was a male leader in the industry. And um, we had some amazing deep conversations about masculinity and, and the problems in, in male and he was part of men's groups and it was amazing. And I put him up on a pedestal because I hadn't met someone like that. And, um, and when we um, became intimate our very first time, he, he tried to choke me. And I spoke to him about it later on. I told him off in, at the time. And it's very hard to, um, I know it sounds easy to say, um, don't let this happen and just walk away. But when, you, when you're invested and you're, and you're madly in love with someone and you're starting to see each other or you've been with someone for a while and they do it for the first time, um, and, and yes, it's crossing boundaries and they haven't asked for consent. And if, and if, and you know, if some people do like those things and I, I agree, there's psychological problems, um, with, with people with fetishes and stuff, each to their own though. I'm not, I'm not judgmental, but he didn't ask for consent and he did cross a boundary and he, he, he put me in fight or flight mode because I've been abused physically for, um, and mentally and, and emotionally and verbally for six years in a previous relationship. So for him to place his hand on my throat, put me in, in a, in an immediate trauma situation. Mm -hmm. I spoke to him about that later and asked him, uh, why did you do that? And, um, he said that his ex loved it. So that's why he did it. So this is this is the thing. It's 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 one thing to 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 be watching this, but to be acting it out with unsuspecting females. If you sat down and have a conversation first and said, "Look, I I'm I'm a bit into this, and I love feet, and I love choking, and I I like to smack people, and I like to blah 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 blah." Um, how do you feel about that? no worries right let's put that put it all out on the table but to take advantage of someone who's in that vulnerable state and who is naked and and thinking that certain things are happening and and to put them in trauma immediately by by doing something like that and you might think a slap on the ass is no big deal but a slap on the ass and pulling someone's hair that's been abused or has trauma you you are asked like i said to a guy once if if you ever do that ever again i will stab you in the nuts I am, I am serious about this. This is not okay. Um, and, and I've said that to him in the moment. Now, when you confront, like I've got a fear of confrontation because of my past in, in abuse. And it's very difficult. I'm very strong on my boundaries. But in the moment, I'm like a deer in the headlights because of my past. And it's awkward when you have to, apart from um, fight or flight and trauma, it's very awkward to confront someone while you are naked and while they are naked and you don't know what they are capable of. And in that moment, you start to freak out and try and dumb it all down and just make the best out of a shitty situation. And then it's only afterwards that you have the confidence or you don't to actually address the issue. So this is why I'm working with women more. I'm working with partners in porn addiction. I have a Facebook group starting up. Um, I'm, I'm not steering away from the men, but I'm doing, um, I'm, I'm becoming a porn addiction specialist. I mean, I already am, but rather than just a men's health, I'm working with anyone that this affects. So women, children, um, teens, uh, couples, we want to get into schools. We want to work with coaches of sports, you know, getting to the sports clubs. That's a massive problem in, in there, the, the, you know, the, the jock kind of mentality in sports clubs. And I speak to guys in soccer clubs and, you know, all of my clients, I, I, I ask them, what is it like in your life around this? Like, how does it feel to um, question your sexuality and because of porn and, and then be in, you know, in a, in a football club, like, how does that feel? So, so, so there's, there's a three, there are 360 view of porn addiction now that we're, that I'm taking. And we're not just focusing on the men. Um, it's really important that everyone 
understand what's going on here and recognize the symptoms um, of porn addiction. Any and and because no man, not one single man that I have spoken to, and I have asked every single one of them because it's on my form, have you told your partner about your habits around porn? Some of them have said, um, she knows I watch porn. And then I'll say, and how much of de- like the detail does she know? The frequency, what you watch, um, what you get off on, what you're ejaculating over every day? No. So no man on this planet that I have spoken to is, is, and I'm talking about the people I've spoken to online as well, not necessarily my clients, none of them have told their partners. So I can guarantee you that the women have no idea what's going on. Um, and even the ones who know that it's a problem in their relationship still don't know how bad this is or what it's doing to their men. And this is really important that we get everyone to step up with healthy boundaries and, and get it all out in the open, you know? Don't, don't have a go at me because you think I'm, you know, anti-porn and I'm anti-sex and, you know, I get comments like, oh, you probably only had sex twice to, you know, conceive your children, things like that. It's just ridiculous. I'm, I'm highly sexual. I, I help people self-pleasure um, in a healthy way and I teach them arousal and I, and I teach them how to unlock their sexual channels. I, I help men become more sexual, more connected, more connected to women, more connected to their life and their job and their reality. So that's where I'm at. That's my intention. Well, you are a wealth of knowledge. <laughs> and I trust that we've been helpful for um, men who yep. uh, have a, a secret double life, oftentimes, yep. uh, that uh, they're, they're getting further and further into um, stuff they never thought they would get into, further mm-hmm. away from the, the men they, they originally were, and then women that are uh, also getting into this, but on the receiving end of guys that have have gotten into this Mm -hmm. and uh, for their own emotional health and physical safety, they need to be very, very mindful and very wise. Yep. So, well, Catherine, thank you so much for your time. We're going to do this again. Yes. And I highly recommend your book, uh, your first book again, uh, what no one told you about pornography and Mm -hmm. you are in the process of writing your second. And uh, I so appreciate your time. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And we'll do it again. Beautiful.